Well, the first thing you have to do is to diagnose breast cancer. In a country like the UK that has a screening program and there is a lot of breast awareness, a lot of the cancers that we diagnose are early stage. And once you diagnose the cancer with a biopsy, uh, usually we proceed to surgically removing uh, uh, the cancer with uh, uh, surgical resection. And that, uh, uh, as often as we can, is uh, to try to preserve the breast. So short of a mastectomy, what we do is so-called breast conserving surgery. Then you need to decide uh, what kind of uh, adjuvant systemic treatment the patient is going to receive. Before that, most patients that have breast conserving surgery will have to have uh, also radiotherapy so that breast cancer does not recur in the breast. Once that is done and you then go on to decide on adjuvant treatment, you have uh, to uh, risk stratify women into different groups because the big question is are they going to benefit from adjuvant therapy in particular when you're talking about chemotherapy. There are two other forms of adjuvant therapy that are used, which is adjuvant hormone therapy and uh, adjuvant therapy with a monoclonal antibody, trastuzumab, respectively for women that are estrogen receptor positive, which is at least 75% of breast cancers, or HER2 positive, which are about up to 15%. Well, the problem is that any systemic treatment, whether that is hormone therapy, chemotherapy, or the monoclonal antibody, which is more targeted therapy, they all carry costs on one side, and on the other they uh, have the potential for toxicity and doing harm. And therefore, we try to make decisions that are rational, and we, we maximize uh, benefit for women that have higher risk. Now, in the case of hormone therapy and uh, trastuzumab, we have very good so-called predictive tests that we do that help us in assigning benefits. So, for example, we know that in women that have estrogen receptor negative breast cancer that they don't benefit from hormone therapy. And we also know that women that have HER2 negative breast cancer do not benefit from trastuzumab therapy. And therefore, we have two tests that we routinely apply in the clinic to make the decisions for those two therapies. Where it gets more difficult is in deciding whether to uh, prescribe adjuvant chemotherapy because we don't have any specific tests that tell us that chemotherapy is or is not going to be effective. And so we make the decisions based on risk profiling women using diagnostic tests that are applied in the clinic today or the promise of novel tests that comes from molecular characterization of tumors that will make these decisions more rational and more quantitative if you want more precise. Well, I think until recently we basically um, did uh, a couple of tests to help make the types of decisions that I was telling you about. On one hand, pathologists look at the tumor they grade the tumor, they size it, they look at the lymph nodes in the axilla and see if they are involved or not. And those three factors, tumor grade, tumor size, and whether the lymph nodes are involved are measure determinants of prognosis. And then on top of that, they would do two immunohistochemical tests, one for the estrogen receptor and the other for HER2, to help predict benefit from therapies, as I mentioned earlier. And therefore, these were the tests that were done and are done in routine practice today. And you can really, just using these two immunohistochemical tests, ER and HER2, you can divide breast cancer into, if you want, four groups. Tumors that are estrogen receptor positive and are negative for HER2. These are the majority of breast cancers, about 70% or so. Tumors that are both positive for estrogen receptor and HER2. They are about 7.5% of breast cancers. Tumors that are negative for estrogen receptor and positive for HER2, they are another 7.5%. And then the remainder 15% of breast cancers are negative to both ER and HER2. So you could say there are four classes of breast cancer that we currently diagnose in the National Health Service. And what we have shown with our work and work of other labs confirming our work is that breast cancer is at least 10 different diseases. And so we can be much more precise in risk stratifying and eventually also stratifying for novel therapies and within these 10 classes try to be more uh, uh, deterministic into whether a given treatment is going to be of benefit or not.
Well, the, the findings that we published on earlier this year in Nature uh, clearly show that breast cancer is, is uh, uh, 10 different diseases. The study was very robust because we identified these 10 subtypes looking at 1,000 breast cancers and then we confirmed in a further 1,000. And since then there has been a publication by an American group, the TCGA group, just published a few months after us uh, in Nature and they again could identify these 10 subtypes. So it looks like uh, uh, now that we have uh, robust evidence uh, that these 10 subtypes have different outcomes and they have probably different biology and surely they will benefit from different forms of treatment that we now need somehow to translate this into clinical application. And that's what my group and other groups worldwide are doing is in coming up with a test that upon diagnosing breast cancer a woman can be assigned to one of these 10 classes. And this is work that is going to occur in the next two or three years and then based on the results of these studies we can then in future offer this as a diagnostic test. Well I think they will be applied by assigning women to these 10 different classes because A, they have very different prognoses. There are classes where the survival is as good as over 90% or so. There are other classes where unfortunately the survival with current therapies is poor. And so in the ones that have very good survival, you could actually start uh, asking whether treatments can be withheld from these women because they might not benefit from them and they because they have such a good prognosis they might just having toxic side effects and on the other side of the coin there are women where unfortunately with our best currently available treatments today they still have a very poor prognosis and therefore those women could be prioritized for trials with new drugs so that's just one of the most obvious forms of clinical application of this information Well, I think that whenever we do studies where um, we're talking about genetics and we're talking about uh, clinical outcomes and, uh, from patients, we need to be uh, uh, very guarded in the way we do this in the sense that we need to protect uh, the autonomy of, of the individuals participating in these studies and there, that means that we can only recruit them into studies if they give appropriate consent. And then after having protected their autonomy, we also need to respect their privacy and the right to, uh, you know, having uh, the, their information not displayed in public. So we have to be very careful that when we report these studies, personal identifiers are completely removed from the data that is publicly available so that people in the general public could not go and identify individual women in these studies. But uh, taking care of respecting autonomy by uh, only recruiting women that have properly consented and proper consenting needs explaining to them that we're going to be obtaining genetic information but also reassuring them that we will do the, will do the utmost to protect their privacy and their, uh, their right for not having their information publicly displayed and whenever we report on them that this is done in a way that respects this uh, data protection, etc., and so that the data is properly anonymized so that people feel confident continuing to participate in these studies. Well, I think that it depends on how you look at it. I think that being a very common malignancy, it's one where we routinely use already predictive tests. I, going back to uh, the first questions you asked me, we routinely in the NHS do two tests, one for estrogen receptor and the other for HER2, that are extremely important in determining treatments, respectively with hormone therapy and the monoclonal antibody trastuzumab. So there is already significant use of predictive tests for routine management of women with breast cancer. Where we are still uh, falling short is in having tests that do likewise for either chemotherapy and we do not have tests at the moment that can tell us whether women are going to benefit or not from chemotherapy and we clearly need to develop those tests and then also tests that will tell us that all current treatments are going to be of no benefit and therefore as I said earlier to prioritize these women for studies of novel compounds and I think that I can see that these are uh, uh, this is where breast cancer stands at the moment, so lots of advance on one hand, but still lots of work to do on the other.